Ladies and gentlemen, let's stand for the reading of God's holy word. Pastors, instead of complaining and whining and wringing their hands, ought to pray for church members church members to do the right thing. Part 6, Praying Through the Bible, number 270, 2 Corinthians, verse 13. That is 2 Corinthians verses 1 through 13, but I may not read all of that tonight. This is the third time I am coming to you, Paul says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all others that if I come again, I will not spare. Verse 3, since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which uh, to you, Lord, is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye, that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I, I pray to God that ye do no evil. And this is what pastors and church leaders ought to be praying. Instead of complaining and whining and wringing their hands about the unfaithfulness of church members and the evil of church members, we ought to be praying like Paul. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we should appear approved. We're not praying. We, we, we uh, should not pray so that uh, we can appear approved in the sight of man. But that ye should do that which is honest for the glory of God. Though we be as reprobates for we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Holy Father God, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, uh, speaking of weakness, uh, I feel that weakness tonight, but I also know that you do wonderful things through people's weakness. And uh, so, Lord God in heaven, give me spiritual, mental, and physical grace and strength to share this short message in the powerful way that you want me to share it, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Have mercy and grace upon uh, wretched and evil and wicked sinners as we are. 
no doubt there's not a person in here who has not uh, or watching me right now live around the world through five streams uh, going out of here in 100 languages who has not had an evil thought or had the suggestion from their wicked heart of an evil word or displayed a bad attitude displayed a spirit of ungratefulness and unthankfulness and pride stubbornness and rebelliousness so Lord uh, help each person here to be honest if they're your child and confess their sins and uh, apologize to you right now in their hearts and repent and turn from their wicked ways so that they can benefit from the message uh, tonight for if their heart is not right they will get nothing from it and they'll stay in their wicked and old and cold ways so have your Holy Spirit to move among us no matter how weak we might be uh, no matter how uh, much sin needs to be confessed Lord uh, help us to be transparent and honest at least with you and confess all sins past present and everything that we have done wrong so that your Holy Spirit can move freely and so that no one would be quenching or grieving your Holy Spirit for it is not as your Holy Word tells us not by might that's human might uh, not by power human power but by my spirit your Holy Spirit saith the Lord so nothing good is going to happen here tonight if it does not come by your power save those who are lost revive those who are saved we do pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would cast out the devil his demons and his hosts and the satanic spirit of Judas betrayal and sabotage from this place and out of the lives of those people who have that issue all we can do is pray and we pray that you would remove the demonic spirit of Demas and uh, Pharaohistic pride and Tobias and Sanballat hinder us of your work uh, Lord we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ give us sweet victory once again over the world the flesh and the devil and have your Holy Spirit to reach people in a way that we uh, cannot do and that souls will be saved and lives changed in Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Paul mentions the word reprobate three times in this passage. He says in verse 5, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. And that means that if Jesus Christ is in you, then you cannot be a reprobate, except ye be reprobates. if you have Jesus Christ in you yes if you will in your heart we do have some young uh, little uh, ill informed young preachers fresh out of seminary the old preachers used to call them uh, cemeteries going around saying don't pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart uh, there's never been anything wrong with that Jesus 
in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You cannot be a reprobate if you have Christ in you. And Paul is reminding them very casually and very lovingly and very calmly. Then he says in verse 6, But I trust that ye shall know that ye that we are not reprobates. I hope you know that Christ is in us and that we are not reprobates. I hope that you will give us that. As you examine me and question my authority and criticize my presence, I hope that you will at least know that since I'm the one that introduced you to Christ, that I have Christ in me, and therefore I am not a reprobate. And notice how short that sentence is. Paul did not even want to even dwell on that at all. He says in verse 6, But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. No matter how critical you are to, about me, and no, no, no matter how uh, mean you might be towards me, I hope that you'll give me enough credit, if you will, that uh, Christ is in me and therefore I am not a reprobate. I hope you know that at least. Verse 7 says, Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Here's the pastoral prayer. And all pastors should be praying this way for the people. Sadly, my beloved, we have too many pastors, like too many people in the counseling field, like too many people in the helps uh, field, like too many people in the psychological field, like too many people in the crisis management field, like too many people in the uh, domestic violence field, like too many people in the pregnancy, uh, unwanted pregnancy field, and all of those social type service uh, organizations and ministries and businesses and they are all over the place. Peer counseling is a new thing uh, that is happening today. We have too many people who are so sick themselves they feel like and that they, they, they want other people rather who are sicker to always need them. And that is borderline demonic. Don't tell me it's not so. There are some pastors who have the pastoral gift and they and they don't give people the solution. They like to keep them hanging on and coming back for more because they feel like that's job security. They don't nip it in the bud and they don't like people who come along nipping stuff in the bud. They, they like the word dialogue. Be, be still in the back. They, they love that word dialogue. They love to pull their draw out. And I'm not only talking about pastors and counselors, but I'm talking, I'm talking about counselors and all these people in this field. Thank God for those who nip it in the bud those who help people in a real sense and give them the solution and say here's what I want you to do one two three you do this if you don't do this you're in disobedience and it's not going to work and don't come back to ask me to help you get out of the mess because you don't want to get out of it because you don't want to listen to what I'm telling you
these people who are is always an open-ended situation. Ongoing, when, when they know the answer, they know the solution. They know how to resolve the problem, but they want people to keep on hanging on and hanging on to them. Not Jesus. Not God. Many pastors and many people in these help uh, helps ministries can reduce a whole lot of stress off of their lives if they would tell the people up front, okay, now cut the mess, cut the foolishness now. Just don't lie to me, because if you lie to me, I can't help you. Okay, so, and, and it's cut in, and not do the, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and you already know they lying. You know they lying on their wife. You they you know they lying on their husband. And, and you because see they train you in in college, and uh, and don't tell me they don't because I know I, I've taken the classes, the crisis classes. You always accept what the victim says. You always. Uh, believe what the, the person who is bringing you the issue says, no matter who it is. And especially if it's a woman or something like that. And oftentimes, women on the other, uh, in the ministry, on the other side of the desk, they know the woman is lying and they just, mm hmm, mm hmm. And then they uh, say, okay, you come back over here and I'm going to. Transfer you over here to this other person, so and keep the keep it going. When sometimes what is needed is uh, not a literal slap in the face, but uh, a wake up call to say, "Listen, woman, you just told me this over here." And the other day when you called, you told me this. Now, stop lying and tell me the truth. And let's nip this in the bud. And here's your solution. At the end of the day, you need to go back to your husband. Apologize for the evil that you have done. And be the wife and the mother that you need to be. And uh, if we need to talk with your husband, uh, I can have the pastor to come by and visit him. Uh, but now, would you admit that you've done some things wrong in this as well? Yes, ma'am. And then it's over with. Stop. You got. And so, what we need to do is tell people the truth and pray for them to do the right thing. Amen. Somebody. There's too much mess going on in the church. All this around the block and all of this lying to people and covering up and, 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 and got them coming back over and over again because you like it because you want to feel needed. And don't tell me this is not so. There are people in the ministry. People go in the ministry. Listen to me very carefully. People go into psychology. People go into counseling and to these helps things. Not to help, but to feel needed to get help themselves. They are wreck themselves. And they like to feel needed. And you're not helping anybody when you're trying to get help yourself by keeping people hanging on and all, all up in their business. When you know what they ought to do. You need to tell them what they need to do. Get out your office and start praying for them. That's it. And by the way, every pastor. Listen to me very carefully. Every trained pastor's wife in counseling. Every trained counselor. Every trained psychologist will tell you people already know what they ought to do when they come to your office boohooing and crying and, uh, and telling a whole bunch of lies. They already know. We all know what we should be doing. We just want to go and, 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 and come and get somebody to agree with what we are saying. 
which is nothing but nothing but a bag of lies in most cases. We need to tell folks the truth. If you notice the tone and the tenor of the Apostle Paul here was straightforward. Not emotional. Straightforward. And, and he was talking to some young Christians. But he was straightforward. He was upfront. He was honest. He was transparent. He was real. But he was cool, calm, and collected. But he told them the truth. And then he says, Now I pray to God. After you have told folk the truth, and after you secondly did not defend yourself when they falsely accused you, and criticize how you did it and how you said it later for that, man. Monk that. Thirdly, you pray for them. And you put them in the hand of God. That's what a whole lot of pastors ought to do for some folk. Who are always coming and crying and boo-hooing. And got that look on their face. My God help us. They got that they got that look. I'm not talking about the feeble folk in the, in the, in the congregation. You are, every congregation has some feeble folk. You're just going to have to love on them and, 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 and work with them. I'm talking about folk who are not feeble-minded. They're just full of hell and the devil and like to keep mess up. And they're mean as the devil in their home. And they don't want to confess their sins. They don't want to repent. The husband does not want to love the wife. The wife does not want to respect the husband. And the children are rebellious as the devil. And it's a confused mess. And they don't want to obey the word of God. And they want you, pastor, to fix it. But they don't want to be fixed. And so, beloved, Paul says, Now I pray to God. I pray to God that ye do no evil. How many of you know tonight, my beloved? That if you can get the evil out of your life, you will resolve many of your problems. What is so sad, so sad, you got some folk who never confess their sins, never admit that they're wrong, never repent and get things right in their relationships with others, and they constantly are doing evil, and they constantly have problems in their marriages, and in their families, and in the church. And some will die doing evil. And at a certain point, Pastor, all we can do is pray for them, because we're not God. Close your little tool drawer. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? Well, you know, you got these pastors that they, they learn, all of them they have learned it at seminary or cemetery or some kind of institution or whatever to use this term. Well, I have some tools for you to use. And then after that, another great term they have is, and then I want to plug you into this system like you are a little, uh, one of those things you plug into a computer. It is disgusting. These little wicked systems that people create that really don't even help people. You know how do people feel? They feel like they're just a number and that you're just pulling a number on them. 
with your little tools and your little plugins. And then another great question when people come to you for help, some of you counselors, some of you pastors, you got your little system so down pat, you don't talk with so many other people who do the same thing, and, and you, you give them this question. So what is your story? And you don't realize that makes them feel like nothing. And that makes them feel like you, you're not even you, you're not even going to take them seriously. So what is your story? Like everybody has a story in your mind. Everybody has a story. Life is life. Real life is not a story, man. People are really going through hell, and you need to be in tune with God, and the Holy Spirit of God, and the Word of God, and you'll you'll be dealing with each person differently if you do that. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Now beloved, we are in a rather long series of messages titled Praying Through the Bible. A series on every passage and verse regarding prayer in the Bible. The purpose of this series is to encourage you and challenge you and if you will motivate you to pray to the God of the Bible and this is a real thing this praying to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for Jesus Christ said ask and ye shall receive seek and ye shall find knock and it shall be open unto you by the grace of God we have highlighted each of these over 500 verses and passages in the prayer motivator devotional Bible so far we have completed 269 messages in this series this is message number 270 270 30 away from 300 by the grace of God it is amazing and this is not every day this is not twice a week this is once a week for over the past five or so years every Wednesday And this message is titled, Pastors Ought to Pray for Church Members to Do the Right Thing. And I think we would see an amazing result if we stop running around trying to put out every fire and just stay put in our prayer closet and pray for the people after we have told them the truth. This is part six. In this passage, beloved, we have seen how Paul challenged the Corinthian believers to examine themselves to see whether they were truly a part of the family of God. We hope that this process was a positive experience for most of the believers, meaning that in the course of examination they found that they were indeed followers of Christ believers in Christ that Christ was in them under the influence of the Holy Spirit however there may have been some who had a negative outcome we don't know Paul leaves open this possibility when he says know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates reprobates in other words either these believers have Jesus living inside of them or they are reprobates they are phonies they are fakes 
The Greek word translated as reprobates is also translated as castaway, rejected in the New Testament. It means not standing the test, not approved, that which does not prove itself such as it ought. In other words, a person who is a phony, a fake, a hypocrite. It is not real. The reprobates were those who did not pass the test of God's examination and of their own self-examination. They could not say they were in the faith. For real. And you know whether or not you're saved. You know whether or not you're born again. I know uh, my dad was a preacher. My mother was a preacher. We were in church all of the time. And people assumed that I was saved. And I was as lost as a goose in the Kentucky Derby. I was as lost as Jesse Jackson in a Ku Klux Klan meeting meeting. I was really lost. I knew I was. I, 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 mean, I wish I, I could say I was saved, but the people that asked me, one lady came and asked me, you're saved, don't you? I said, no, ma'am. She said, oh, sure you are. I walked away. I said, what? I'm telling you I'm not saved. Before I got saved, I knew I was not saved, and after I truly got saved, I knew I was saved. Amen, somebody. Merriam-Webster defines reprobate as that which is unworthy, unacceptable, or evil, and that which is foredained to damnation. Easton's Bible Dictionary defines reprobate as that which is rejected on account of his own worthlessness, wickedness, and evil. This word is also used with reference to persons cast away or rejected because they have failed to make use of opportunities offered to them to be saved by Jesus Christ. Dr. Warren Worsby said, No doubt many of the problems in the church at Corinth were caused by people who professed to be saved but who had never repented of their sins and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Our churches, he went on to say, our churches are filled with such people today. And that is so true. Paul called such people reprobate, which means counterfeit, discredited, phony, fake, even after a test. Paul used this word again in 2 Corinthians 13, emphasizing the fact that it is important for a person to know for sure, for sure, that he is saved, that he is born again, and that he is going to heaven when he or she dies. Amen, somebody. Are you sure tonight? Are you sure? Have you examined yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith? Are you born again? Here's one sign that you can know that you're not reprobate and that you're saved. It's just one. Whereas before you got saved, sin did not bother you. In fact, it bothered you if you were not sinning. But now that you have trusted Christ as Savior, you can't even have an evil thought you are finding a place to confess your sins, repent. You can't even be even think about telling a lie. You have to uh, ask God to forgive you. 
This is just one sign of a truly born-again person, a person who is not a reprobate. Sin bothers you. Sin troubles you. If you can sin, if you can lie, if you can cheat, if you can steal, if you can say a wicked, mean word to somebody, and you're not troubled by it, you're, you're not convicted, listen to me very carefully, if you're not convicted by it, you don't feel any compunction, uh, there's, you, 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 you have never been born again. I assure you, you have not been saved. If you can sin and just march right on, tell a lie and keep on stepping, steal something from somebody and keep on stepping, uh, uh, the people who are truly born again, uh, they are concerned about whether or not they should return the cart from the grocery store. Th that, that would be on their minds. Something like that. And by the way, at Trader Joe's, you, 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 we at Trader Joe's people, we return the car. And some of us at Walmart, we concern about it, but we don't return the car. Just last night, my oldest son picked up some things uh, uh, for. Uh, from the grocery store and he normally returns the cart. He makes it a point to return the cart. I guess he was too sleepy or too tired and he put the cart over there against the curb and evidently the place was getting ready to close and the old lady came out and she went and got the cart. You say, Preacher, did you feel bad? I felt terrible. Even though I had nothing to do with it but uh, I felt terrible about it. Whereas before I got saved, that stuff like that didn't bother me. So, so that's just one sign. That's one way you can examine yourself and see whether or not you be in the faith or if you're a reprobate. Sin does not bother you. Lying does not bother you. Saying evil, ungodly words don't bother you. S stealing a little something, purloining something real slick and put it in, putting it in your pocket, taking it from the job does not bother you. Taking toilet paper and, and, and paper towels and, and using it at home. I, I, I bring that up because I know somebody who did it. It did not bother him. It bothered me that he did it. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit of God. You'll never be the same once you get born again. And Dr. John Walvert of Dallas Theological Seminary and Dr. Roy Zuck in their fine commentary said, Paul's question is usually construed with regard to positional justification. Were they Christians or not? But it more likely concerned practical sanctification. Did they demonstrate that they were in the faith and that Christ was in them by their obeying His will? Somebody ought to say, man, right there. See, see, I shared with some folks, I think it was earlier this morning, it might have been yesterday, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again. He suffered your hell so that you can be saved. I, I would think you would understand that going forward, once you trust Christ, that this is about obedience going forward. Not because you are trying to get saved through obedience, but because you are saved. Amen, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus Christ suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins. That includes your bad attitude, your nastiness, your meanness, your lies, your constantly uh, acting like a Judas and plotting and trying to hinder other people in the ministry and in the work of God, your hatefulness, your racism, 
uh, he died for all of that. So I hope you understand that once you trust this man named Jesus Christ, that it's about obedience to him going forward. Amen, somebody. For Jesus Christ said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus Christ said, Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Oh yes, it's about obedience. If you're truly born again and you're not a reprobate, you will wake up with God on your mind. You will go to bed with God on your mind. Uh, you, God will, when you're getting ready to say something crossways to your wife that is wicked from hell or to your husband, God will intervene and tell you, don't you say that. You might, you can say this, but you can't say that. What you're getting ready to say right now. That's the Holy Spirit of God because He, he warns you about that because that's going to break fellowship with Him. Be very careful about what you, 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 you're going to be very careful about what you say and do because you don't want that broken fellowship that's in your spirit, in your soul with God. If you're saved and you're not a reprobate, you'll never call somebody a fool. You're just not going to do it. I don't care how angry you get. And there, and there are people who do this and I feel sorry for their soul. You're just not going to do it. To stand the test was to do what was right. To do the will of God. To fail was to be disobedient and therefore subject to God's discipline and judgment. The words failed the test and failed uh, render the Greek word uh, adokiboi. Translated reprobate. Some of the people in the Corinthian church were worldly in their mentality like so many in the church are today. Now let me help you. If you're truly born again, ladies, if you're saved, uh, you, you're going to be convicted about wearing skinny jeans, Yoga pants, you're just going to be convicted about it. You, you can go ahead on and do it because the world is doing it. You're trying to look like Kim Kardashian or somebody. You don't, by the way. You're going to be concerned, if you're saved, about your modesty. You're going to feel naked before the world wearing some things unless you are reprobate. Same thing for men. You are not to be going out to the church with your shorts on and no shirt, going around other men's wives and all of this kind of thing, thinking you're cute, trying to show your little muscles that you done picked up at the gym. And you have taken some steroids and now you can't even go to the bathroom. Don't get mad with me. I know men who loved muscles so much they took steroids and other kind of drugs uh, and, and it, 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 it shrunk their private parts. They can't even uh, have sex with their wife. The thing that attracted them, uh, the woman to the man, the big old muscles, now uh, he can't perform in the bedroom because he's a, a drugged himself out. Then you want to put on your little muscle shirt and go uh, and show off in the church and all this kind of mess. Uh, you, you, if you're saved, you're going to be convicted about that. You're not going to do that. They were caught up in the dispute over whether Paul was a valid leader. <laughs> Is everybody all right? <laughs> oh, my. They were caught up in the dispute 
over whether Paul was a valid leader because they were more concerned about following man than following God. And don't you get mad with me. You know it's true. Those who were truly saved knew that Jesus was ultimately their leader. See, see, this is another thing as a child of God. There's certain things you don't even have to be taught. You know. You don't get caught up in no pastor worship. We, and we got two, listen to me very carefully. This, this, is, this is idol worship. And God is not pleased with it. We, ha we have too many Christians, especially among some women. They're nothing but groupies. They just love that particular preacher. They just love him. And anything he says, they, they sign up, they follow him, and so forth and so on. And then they don't like this one. They, so they, this, this group loves this one, and so forth. And they, they'll go to any revival, any meeting that he's at. It's like a, a, a wicked, incestual, uh, groupy situation. Because you're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ. He is not your Lord. I don't care how eloquent he is. I don't care how Apollo can say it. And get you all caught up in your emotions. He is not your leader. Jesus is a man somebody. And I know I'm right about it. Stop following men and women. Oh, that's my preacher. That's my pastor. I tell you, I just love it. And he's committing adultery, fornication. He's a drunk. He's a drug addict. He's strung out. He's always in mess. And 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 yet you will come back and say, do no harm to the prophet and all this kind of stuff like that. He's probably a reprobate himself. Stop following men. You say, I don't like that. I don't like you. I'll never listen to you again. That's fine. That's fine. I got you this time. Stop following men and follow Jesus. That's what Paul was about. The Holy Spirit in their heart agreed with the Holy Spirit that spoke through Paul's letters. No matter how weak his presence seemed. So two things there. People who are truly born again, they're not going to get caught up in following some man. We don't even think that way. That's ridiculous. And secondly, the Holy Spirit inside of you will agree with the Holy Spirit inside of a true preacher or teacher of the Word of God. I can't put, I can't, we can't put our finger on it, but we know that we know that we know when somebody's of God and somebody's a reprobate, a false prophet, a phony and a fake. We get a check in our spirit in a hurry. So examine yourself and see whether or not you be in the faith or whether or not you are a reprobate. Let's pray. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for this wonderful time together around your holy word, around a difficult and strange subject. Uh, this word reprobate is alien to uh, most of us in this world. So thank you for uh, leading and guiding and directing and dealing with this strange subject, frightening subject for some. And so, Holy Father God, help everyone here, everyone under the sound of my voice, everywhere in the world, and we thank you, uh, Lord, not only live but on demand, uh, thousands listen to these messages all around the world. 
uh, on their little iPhones and other phones and devices. And we give you the glory, praise, and honor for this technology that allows us to do this in these, uh, maybe these last days. And so, Lord, those of us who are saved, help us to walk by faith and not by sight. And help us to keep on following you and lifting you up and telling others about you. Those who have found themselves to be reprobate or lost, help them to confess their sins and trust Christ as Savior before it is eternally too late. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, my beloved, as we close, if you were to die today, where would you go? Heaven or hell? If you are with us tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your first prayer needs to be what we call the sinner's prayer. First, please understand that you are a sinner just as I am. And that you have broken God's laws, God's commandments, God's Ten Commandments. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We die physically because of sin. We die spiritually and go to hell because of sin. The body goes to the grave. Our soul goes to hell if we don't trust Christ as Savior. Jesus Christ has said as much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when he said very clearly in Matthew 10:28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Hell is an awful place. Hell is a sad place. That is the bad news. But the same Jesus gives us the good news in St. John 3.16. For God so loved the world, Jesus Christ said long ago, that he gave his only begotten son. He was talking about himself. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So dear friend, if you want to be saved from sin and hell tonight, and have a new life, a life of peace that passeth all understanding, and joy unspeakable, and a life of purpose, a life of winning by trusting Christ you automatically become a winner it's a beautiful life it's a tough life but it's a beautiful life I wouldn't trade of anything in the world and I encourage you to trust Christ as Savior tonight don't be scared don't be fearful just give your heart to Christ. Believe on Jesus Christ that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and pray and ask him to save your soul right now tonight. And I'll be glad to lead you in prayer. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 13 that if thou, you, shall confess with your mouth of the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart, that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou, you, shalt be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Verse 13 says, For whosoever, that word whosoever means anybody at any time, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell, people. So pray and ask him to save you today. I'll lead you in prayer. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Holy Father God, in heaven, sitting on your throne, please have mercy and grace upon me, a sinner. 
For I acknowledge and I admit that I am a sinner. And I know for a fact that I have sinned against you. I have stolen things before. I have lied before. I have coveted and lusted after women who are not my wife. Men who are not my husband. And other things. I realize that I have broken your Ten Commandments, or at least some of them. And just like a criminal deserves jail, I deserve hell. Have mercy and grace upon my soul. For Jesus Christ's sake, please forgive me of my sins. My failures and my faults. My shortcomings. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul. And change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to repent of my sins past. And to turn from my old life. And to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I pray and for his sake. Amen. Now dear friend of mine, if you just trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you just believed on Christ as your Savior and you prayed that prayer and meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, the Bible, you are now saved from hell and you're on your way to heaven. Welcome to the family of God. The devil is mad, but heaven is glad. Congratulations on believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have done the most important thing in life and all you've done is believe on Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ told you to do and wants you to do. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. And it will give you next steps in your Christian faith. For Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door by me if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Dear friend, God loves you. We love you. And may God bless you real good is my prayer. Thank you so much, all of you on Periscope, Facebook Live. Uh, we thank you for all of the love you show this poor uh, preacher. And uh, we thank you for your faithfulness. And... Uh, and how that you have been a blessing down through the years. Uh, on Gospel Light House of Prayer, Gospel Light Society, all of you, uh, we thank God for you. 